Well, good morning. Hey, I, I hate that I had to come back up here right after that, but uh, understand that that is not indicative of how you look this morning, just your sweater. So we want to make sure that's clear up front. Hey, uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Chris. I get to be uh, the youth pastor here at ACC. So if you're in 6th through 12th grade, uh, you should know me. If you don't, I would love to hang out with you afterwards. I'll be at the Big Green Wall. Uh, I'd love to get to know you. If you're a parent of one or you know somebody who is one, I would love to just get to know you. Uh, so I'll be out there after the service. We are working through a series called Oh What Fun, and last week Pastor Matt talked about light and how light pierces the darkness, how decorations ought to point us to Jesus. This week I get tasked with this idea of the 12 days of Christmas. Now the 12 days of Christmas are, it is one of my favorite Christmas songs. If you guys have never watched the Straight No Chaser uh, video, I'm not going to show it this morning, but it is incredible. They do an incredible job, and it just turned my eyes to love this song. And so this morning, we're going to talk about gifts. And, and it's a pretty integral part of Christmas, right? I mean, this is something uh, that when we get to this Christmas season, the giving and receiving of gifts is, is fairly important. Some of you this morning, you got those sweaters, and maybe you don't think they're ugly. But um, anyway, so when we look at gifts, some of us have gotten really terrible gifts along the way. By show of hands, how many of you right now would say, I know what I'm getting everybody on my Christmas list? I already, I know the gifts, I know what I'm getting them. Wow, not very many people. Also, okay, all right, how many of you have already went out and bought all of them? Wow, you are overachievers. You know there's two weeks till shopping day, right? All right, how many of you would say right now, I've already got them wrapped up under the tree or in my hiding place so that nobody can find them? How many of you have, wow, so many of you, stop. All right. Look, we all remember those terrible gifts we got growing up. Maybe for you it was socks or underwear, or my favorite Christmas movie is A Christmas Story, where they get those ugly pajamas with the bunnies, like the big ears on. Like, who wears that to bed? So when I look at uh, Christmas, I think through the lens of, of gifts more often than not. I remember growing up, uh, I grew up before iPads and cell phones and all of that were super you know, awesome. So our joy each Christmas was begging our parents for a Nintendo or Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis as they were all coming out. And, and every year we'd get there and every year we'd rip open presents and every year there'd be nothing. And so in 1994, PlayStation 1 comes out. And we beg, my brother and I beg my parents for this PlayStation. We beg them. We get to Christmas morning rip open all the gifts, not there. So we clean up all the, all the wrapping paper, put it on the trash can, and then my dad mysteriously finds another gift. He pulls it out, and there, it, like we rip it open. First ever video game system that we ever had. It's a PlayStation 1. We still have it to this day. Now, the gift, I mean, I have other ones, but, but the gift was not important in that moment, Right? The gift was only valuable because of the person who gave it to us. We recognized the sacrifice that was made, the time that was spent, the, the thought that went into it, the heart behind it. You see, the gifts are not what matter. It's the giver that gives them value. And that's kind of the walk away. If, if you take away one thing that I say today, understand that to fully enjoy a gift, to fully enjoy a gift, you have to know the giver. In order to fully enjoy a gift, you have to know the giver. And what's interesting, if we were to think about it, ladies, if you walked into your office tomorrow morning or you came home today, well, let's not say go home because that, that would give too much away. Let's just say you walked out today, somebody handed you a random diamond ring and just went on about their way. Now, you would look at that diamond ring and you'd be like, wow, I could pawn this for a lot of money. <laughs> or maybe you want to keep it because you think it's pretty, but if you lost it, you're like, meh not really any sentimental value, just kind of found this ring. Somebody's tossed it to me. Now imagine that you go home today, or you walk out, 
and your husband or your boyfriend or whoever comes up and, and hands you a piece of jewelry. Maybe they're going to propose and they drop to a knee. That's super romantic. Or, or maybe they just give you a really pretty piece of jewelry. Now that carries along sentimental value. If you lose that piece of jewelry, everything changes, right? Why? Did the gift change? No, it's the same ring. What changed was the giver. And we, during this Christmas season, get so wrapped up in the gifts sometime that we forget about the one who gave us the gift. And so, as we look this morning, I want us to flip open to Matthew chapter 2. So if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to flip open to Matthew chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, it's okay. Grab the one in front of you, and we're going to read through some, uh, some of Matthew chapter 2. Before we do that, I wanna, while you guys are doing that, I want to show you guys a video that helps illustrate this point really well. One thing I love uh, to watch during this season um, are the reactions of the kids who don't get what they want. I mean, come on. Who doesn't sit on YouTube for hours and watch the kid who thought he was getting a trip to Disney World and ended up getting a Mickey doll, right? And they're like, this is awful. I hate my life. <laughs> so I went on YouTube this week and watched a lot of them. And I found this one that has a really neat ending that I want to show you guys this morning to help draw this point home. Check this out. Okay, so now Rebecca gets to go first. Then Rebecca. And then Jacob. And then Nick. <gasps> what is it? Oh, oh. Lego Star Wars. It's all for Rebecca. It's all just for Rebecca. Just me and you. No, just for Rebecca. My present. Oh, okay. Rebecca's present. I want. I want. Oh, I want. No, you're getting one. Oh, you're getting one. You're getting one. You're getting one. Let's do Nick Jacob's okay, first. Jacob, don't take. It's okay. Okay, now Jacob gets to go, and then you. And then you're going to get to go, too. Just a minute. Don't be upset. It's okay. Okay, it's okay. <gasps> A remote control Ferrari. All for me. Let's see what your little present is. Let's open it. I love it. Oh, it's Thank so special. Look at the wrapping paper. What's on the wrapping paper? Now I don't know what's in it. Now there's two wrapping. What's in this? Now, you know what's interesting about that video? You would have thought when that kid opened up that box of oranges that he would have been disappointed. Let's all be honest for a minute. Oranges are nasty, right? And if you don't agree with that this morning, just, just mm, no. Like, they get underneath your fingernails. They smell. Their, it's No, it's nasty. Oranges are gross. However, this kid, when he opens up that box and those oranges come out, he grabs the oranges. He is so excited. Why? Is it because the gift is awesome? No. Because of the one who gave it to him. He knows who gave him that gift. And he cherishes that. It's a beautiful picture for us of what this season is all about. Now, in Matthew chapter 2, I want to show something that maybe, if you come to church at Christmas often, you've probably heard the story of the wise men coming and, and seeing Jesus. But I want to give us a little bit more, maybe a little bit of context as to what's happening here. Now, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. It's considered to be one of the four Gospels. The reason why is the Gospels uh, tell the story of Jesus. They're eyewitness accounts of what Jesus does in his life and his ministry. Specifically, in Matthew chapter 2, it tells of Jesus' birth and what Jesus uh, endures through his birth. So I want to take a look at Matthew chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now let's pause there for a second. I want to draw out a couple of really important pieces. 
First, we think about Bethlehem for just a minute. Now, Bethlehem literally translates to house of bread. Now, that might not seem significant, but later on in Jesus' ministry, he is called the bread of life. This thing that gives us substance, that, that allows us to live. It's the thing that, that sustains us in difficult times. Jesus called this, this is kind of a foreshadowing of that. But it also is the city of David, the place where the king, the, one of the greatest, greatest, if not the greatest king of Israel lived, was raised. And this city of David is important. It's important because it displays Jesus' kingly lineage, that he was born of David, which means that he is in line as rightful heir to the throne. So we see this really significant piece in just the little city in which Jesus is born. But we're also introduced to some characters, right? We're introduced to these guys called the wise men, or maybe your Bible says magi or magicians. This is where we get our English word magician from. Now, the wise men were what were called astrologers. Now, this is very different than what is astronomy. Astronomy is the study of the stars. Astrology is something very different and very mystical. Now, the reason that these wise men would know anything about this, uh, this important star is this, that in uh, a couple hundred years earlier, the Jews were taken to Babylon as prisoners during the time of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And during that time, those, these wise men would have learned of the prophecies of this coming Messiah. And so in Numbers chapter 24, if you were to look back, there's a prophecy of a star that will rise where the Messiah is to be born. And so these wise men, as they're studying the stars, see this star and begin to follow it, knowing the prophecy that's been, uh, that's been pro uh, prophesied before. And so these wise men begin to follow this pathway all the way to Bethlehem. This would have been like an 800-mile journey from basically what is modern-day Iraq, Babylon area, to Bethlehem. Now, what's interesting about astrologers is that this mystic form would basically be where you get your horoscopes from today. And so if you wake up in the morning and you read your horoscope to find out what your destiny is, let me just challenge you to recognize that the stars don't hold your destiny, Jesus does. And that instead of reading your horoscope every morning, maybe we can pick up our Bibles and see what Jesus has to teach us each morning. Now, with that in mind, we see something really significant, that these men who were not believers, they probably weren't even Jews, wanted to find if this prophecy was true. It also is an indication that Jesus was not just for the Jews, that he was for all people. So the wise men come, they ask where the king was. Look at verse three. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? Now, we're introduced to another guy, right? King Herod. Now, Herod is a mean dude. Herod was known as a vicious ruler, one who would kill who any, he would kill anyone who he did not trust. Historians tell us that this went so far as to killing his own wife and son because he no longer trusted them. So this man is power hungry. He was set in rule in around 40 BC, and he's been ruling at this point for about 36, 35, 36 years. And he is the self-proclaimed king of the Jews. Now, what's interesting is when the wise men come in verse 2, what do they ask? Hey, uh, where's the guy who's been born king of the Jews? Now, you can see Herod is immediately angry. Why? Because this is a jab at his power. I'm, I'm right here. I am the king of the Jews. Well, no, no. We, we heard about one who's going to be born king of the Jews. Where is he at? And Herod shifts his thought and begins now to plot a way to kill this baby. Check out what happens in verse 5. In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. And then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned 
from them the time when the star first appeared. And then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so I can go and worship him too. See, he's plotting already. After this interview, the wise men went their way and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. Now, I don't want you to miss what happens in verse 10. I don't want you to miss this. Check this out. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. Or maybe your Bible says overjoyed. Let me tell you why this is cool. Christmas morning, my kids come out. All the gifts are wrapped. And they are so excited. It's Christmas morning! Right? Like, joy is over. They don't even know what's in the box. It could be socks and underwear for all they know. But they are so excited to rip them open. This is what I picture when I look at the wise men here. They don't have a clue what's behind the door. It could be anything. They've seen the star, but they are so excited for the opportunity to open the door, to see what's inside, to see if the prophecy is coming true. And look what happens in verse 11. They opened the door. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. And then they opened their treasure chest and they gave him gifts. This is where our tradition comes from of giving gifts. They bowed down, they worshiped him. They gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, recognize that they had taken so long to travel there that Jesus was no longer in the manger. He was in a house. And they come into the house, and they see Jesus hanging out with his mom, and they immediately sit down to worship him. And, and what's interesting to me is that these gifts, and we'll talk about these gifts in just a second, but a gift communicates something to the person that you give it to. It communicates value, and it communicates love. Every gift that you give communicates value, communicates love. Every gift that you receive allows you to feel valued and loved. And so when they they give these gifts, they're displaying a sense of value and love before their king. Now let's talk about the gifts and why these gifts are significant. There are three of them, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. At least three that we know of. Now, Gold in every culture is a symbol of not just royalty, but authority, power, money, wealth, prosperity. Like it's a semblance of, I want to be that guy. If I walked in here and had 24 karat gold block here, none of you'd be like, oh, that's it? Huh, whatever. Right? You'd all be like, what does that guy do for a living? I'm a pastor. I got a 24 karat. I'm joking. Gold in every culture across all all spectrums always signifies a semblance of wealth and power. Frankincense, the second gift that's given to Jesus, is always is a really sweet smelling aroma, but it's considered in worship services, it's often burned as a sacrifice, an offering to the God that they are worshiping. That doesn't mean that they're worshiping our God, it just means that they're worshiping a God. So they would burn this frankincense as a sweet aroma to the God in whom they are praying to. The third gift, myrrh, has some really neat foreshadowing to it. Myrrh was often used as a burial or an embalming fluid. Now what's interesting to me is in Mark 15, uh, Jesus is standing, or he's, uh, he's on the cross, hanging on the cross, and they dip a sponge down into some Vinegar and myrrh. This is a foreshadowing. In the cradle, Jesus is offered myrrh. A couple years later, on the cross, Jesus is offered myrrh. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus' purpose on this earth. He was here for a reason. He was here to die. In John 19, when they take Jesus off the cross, Nicodemus Uh, And uh, Joseph used myrrh as the burial fluid to put over, like the burial uh, perfume to put over Jesus. So 
the three gifts that are given, gold symbolizes power. This is not an ordinary child. This child is one with great power and authority. Frankincense, this child is, is worthy to be worshipped. And myrrh, this child has been born for a purpose, for a reason. And he's come to die. Each of those gifts brings a semblance of significance to it. And so I want to encourage you this Christmas, as you receive gifts or give gifts, to remember that you are reflecting the gospel, the giving of Jesus to us. I want us to be reminded that in our gift giving, that we are honoring the Savior who also gave us an incredible gift. But also to remember who the gift represents. And I want to make sure that's clear. Because oftentimes you say, do you know what this gift represents? Do you know what it represents? I'm not saying that. I'm saying who it represents. Because each gift that you give represents Christ. And so with that in mind, we have to be really mindful because Romans 3.23 tells us this, that the wages, the, 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 what we've earned, what we deserve is death. But the gift that Jesus has given us is eternal life. The value comes in the giver. Because if I said, Mario, I'm giving you eternal life today, I'd be like, uh, cool, man. All right. Yes. We need to talk to Pastor Matt about that guy. I can't give you because the, the value doesn't come from me. The eternal life value in Jesus alone. Think about it like this. Why is it that when your, your smaller kids bring in these terrible drawings, and they say, Mom, Dad, look! Or Grandma, Grandpa, look! I made you this! And you're like, all right. Awesome. awesome. And you, you put it up on the fridge, or you put it in your office, and you act like it's a Monet. Why? Was it the awesome coloring? No. Oftentimes, that is not the case. Because the value came from the person who gave it to you. So this morning, we deserved death. But Jesus' birth brought us life. We deserved punishment. But Jesus' birth brought us pardon. We deserved condemnation, but Jesus' birth brought us the Messiah. And he freed us. And the wise men, when they came, they bowed before the Messiah and worshiped as a symbol to you and to I that if we too are going to be wise that we must bow before the king and call upon his name as king and master and savior and lord bowing is a symbol of, of surrender right it's a symbol of, of obedience and then the wise men laid their gifts before the king as a symbol to you and to I that we too ought to lay down the gifts that we have. Well, Chris, I don't have anything that I can give to God. But you do. God wants you. He wants you this morning. He wants you this Christmas, your life. He wants what you have, which is your sin and your nastiness and your filth and he wants to say, come to me and let me clean you. Let me make you pure and holy this Christmas. You see, if we miss the symbolism of Matthew chapter 2, we think that the most important gifts were the three that were given before him, but it wasn't. It was the one that was born. That's the true gift that we get this Christmas. And this morning, the question is, are you going to lay down your life before the Messiah? Is this Christmas the one where you say, I need to surrender my life to God? Maybe this morning you've surrendered your life, and this was a great reminder of the importance of Jesus this Christmas. 
I wanna challenge you differently this morning. I wanna challenge you this week to pay it forward. I wanna challenge you this week to, to just do one random act of kindness to somebody. Pay for their coffee, pay for their lunch, pay for their groceries, take somebody to coffee that you know is struggling, buy somebody's Christmas gifts. This, like, just find a way to, to pay it forward and allow the joy that these wise men experience in giving to equally be displayed through you. Because church, we have an opportunity to display the gift of Christ to the world. So this morning, if you're struggling and you need to give your life to Jesus, we are here. You can find one of us, come down front afterwards. Like we, this season is incredibly important. And it's often this season where we see people's lives changed. And you could be one of those this morning that says, I need Jesus. And I want to encourage you this Christmas to take hold of the true gift that's been given. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this incredible church. God, their heart for you. And I pray this morning that you would be honored, that you would be glorified. God, for the one in the room this morning who's saying, man, I'm struggling and I need Jesus. I can't live another day without surrendering my life to him. Jesus, I pray that you would not let that person leave this room, leave this church without giving their lives to you. May this Christmas matter in a powerful way because it will be their spiritual birthday. God, I ask that you would change lives in this church this season. Allow us to be a vessel used for your glory. We love you and we thank you. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a great week, church.